Hi everyone, so thanks for uh, being there. So today, so I'm very glad that we have uh, Antoine Jou with us. Uh, Antoine is a well-known cryptographer. Uh, he's the recipient of the Godel Prize for his work on uh, tripartite uh, Diffie Hellman. He's also a fellow of the uh, IRCR. Uh, currently, Antoine is a researcher at CISPA and also an honorary professor at the University of Saarbrücken. Um, so when Antoine is not uh, building cryptographic constructions, so he's breaking them. So actually Antoine uh, found a lot of vulnerabilities or uh, broke uh, many cryptographic schemes. And so today we'll report on his finding on the uh, uh, finite field isomorphism problem that was introduced as a way to build uh, fully morphic encryption. So Antoine, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you also to, to Jeremy for the invitation. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, should be okay for, for everyone. Just tell me if something is, something is wrong. Um, okay, so today I would like to speak about the finite field isomorphism problem. So it was uh, one of these, uh, of these new problems that were introduced in order to try to do many cryptographic things, including uh, fully homomorphic encryption. So I would like to revisit uh, how, what, what, uh, what the problem is, uh, why it was supposed to be hard, and, um, and how it can be used for doing FHE, and then try to look at the, um, at the um, security of this problem and see how we can uh, break it. So for this, I will have first to recall a few things about finite fields, because they are a key part of this problem, so I need to remind um, to remind you, okay, for at least for Victor, this will probably be completely useless. So hi, Victor. But for for maybe for um, maybe some of you are not that much familiar with these things and would like to uh, would like to have some uh, some some more background before we start. So so I I will just start with this reminder on how do we represent finite fields. So um, as usual, as always, it depends. It depends which finite field you want to you want to represent. So if you want to represent a prime field GF of p, you know how how you do you, how you do that. You just work with numbers modulo p. You do multiplication addition modulo p. Well, inverse is a little bit trickier, but you know you can do this either by extended GCD or some exponentiation. So everything is pretty cool. Um, things become more complicated when you want to look at finite fields whose uh, cardinality is a prime power and not, uh, not just a prime. And in that case, basically what you have to do is you have to work modulo two things at the same time. So have, you have to work modulo a prime, the, the P, which is called the characteristic of the field, but you also have to work modulo a polynomial. And so which, which polynomial do you select? Well, you select any polynomial uh, of degree k, which is irreducible. So irreducible means that there is no way to factor it into lower degree polynomials. So it's basically the equivalent of primes uh, for polynomials. And once you have this, um, well, you know that if you just work in the, in the algebraic uh, closure of the field, there is some root somewhere. And the only thing you need to do to represent the finite field is to virtually add this root and compute with it. And you know the rule of how to compute with it because you know that the case power of, the, of, the, of this root will simplify according to the irreducible polynomial you have chosen. And uh, so this is the picture you get. You have the prime field FP. Um, and then on top of it, which is the way to represent uh, that the usual notation to represent field extension, you have FQ, which is just FP of alpha. And in that field, there is some very specific and interesting map that we, you, we, we, we consider a lot, which is called the Frobenius map, which is a map that sends any element x to x to the p. And the very important thing of this uh, map is that it's, it's linear, uh, it's p linear. So it's linear um, uh, when you view fq as a vector space over, over fp which is one way where you, you can do that, but you are just forgetting a little bit of structure when you, when you just view it as a, as a vector space. Okay, so this is really the, the, the starting picture. 
And you might uh, you might tell me uh, what if I choose a different irreducible polynomial? Uh, I'm, 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 am I going to get a different finite field? And the answer is no. There is a unique finite field of characteristic f uh, uh, of characteristic p to the k, uh, but it can be represented in many ways. So, um, and how many representation do we have? That's a good question. And it's, uh, it's one of the basic things that you can uh, learn when looking at this finite field. So what, what, you, what you see there is that, okay, let's think. If I take an irreducible polynomial, uh, it gives me one way to define the field. And you know that every irreducible polynomial has exactly k root in the, uh, in the algebraic closure. So if you just forget about, uh, if you just count irreducible polynomials, and divide in their number by, by k, you get the number of, uh, of representation you can have. Uh, sorry, not if you get the number of irreducible polynomial, you get the number of representation. But because every uh, irreducible polynomial has k root, for every element that does not belong to a subfield, you get, uh, you, you get one representation, but you have to count the, all the conjugates. Or, all the image by Frobenius that belong to the same polynomial. That's why the number of representation is close to, to Q divided by K. Okay, so, and how do you move between representations? Well, the only thing you have to do is you have to find the root of the target of the target polynomial uh, with respect to the source polynomial. And uh, this can be done by using uh, by using root finding algorithm, which are well known. So you, you just have to do basic computation and it's polynomial time and you can move from one, uh, one, from one, one representation to the other. Okay, but now the question when you see that is, how should I choose f of x? How should I choose my irreducible polynomial? And um, well, the, question, the, the answer is it depends. What do you want to do with it? So if you want to do the computation as quickly as possible, it's quite nice to have f of x having some structures that will help you doing the modular reduction, for example. And uh, for crypto application, uh, it depends. And we will see in the, ca the case of the FFI uh, problem, um, what, what was uh, proposed there. And there are a few more questions because the finite field is unique. Uh, you expect that there should be some properties that shouldn't depend on the representation of the field. Some, so th which are what we call the intris intrinsic properties of element. And I'm going to give you a, a tiny bit of information about that. And, and the main question we want to address today is if we take one of these good representations that makes computation easy, is there a way to somehow hide it into a bad looking representation to have something that will be easy for the person that knows the, the way the representation has been hidden uh, and that will not be accessible to other people. Okay, good. So let's look at the, let's look at the computation. So if you just want to do a regular arithmetic, uh, well, you have these elements which are polynomial modulo, uh, modulo the irreducible polynomial on modulo p. Addition is easy. You just add the coefficient of the polynomials. Multiplication is a little bit more complicated. You multiply the polynomial, but then you have to reduce modulo the irreducible polynomial f of x. And we have this Frobenius map. So you could try other techniques which have been used in lots of places in crypto. To get to make your your field computation faster, so these alternative approaches, I'm not going to look at them much today, but let's just give their name. So you have some things which are called normal bases, which make um, which make multiplication uh, which which make sorry uh, Frobenius map faster, but at the cost of uh, of having a multiplication a little bit more expensive. And you have the magical elliptic basis of Couvain and Lercier that makes all operation very fast, at least asymptotically. In practice, uh, it's a bit uh, mind blowing to, to work with that because you have, to, you have to use an elliptic curve and find a point uh, somewhere in the extension to represent the thing. It, it can be a little bit difficult if you want to work out the details, but, but it's fun. 
And it can also be used to compute discrete logs. So it's even more fun. OK. So to move between representation, I told you, you just have to find a root. And how do you find the root of g of x? Well, you just use factoring algorithm, uh, which are polynomial time for, for polynomials, uh, to factor g of x in fp of alpha, so the field represented by s. And the thing, when, when, you, when you factor, you will get k linear factor. So now you have to choose one. But, and any one will work. Uh, and they will be equivalent up to Frobenius. But um, so that's, you, you have a little bit of choice here. And if I look at the interest, intrinsic property of element, I told you um, that there might be some. And the main, the main thing is that if you fix an element, um, there is going to be something which is its minimal polynomial. So it's an irreducible polynomial um, that vanishes when you evaluate it at this element. And this polynomial uh, is, doesn't depend on how the element was defined. This, this polynomial is really completely intrinsic, and it contains two very important coefficients. So you look at the polynomial. It's a polynomial of degree k if the, if, if the element doesn't belong to a subfield. And there will be two very important uh, coefficients, the constant coefficient, which will be called the norm of the element uh, up to sign, because it's the product of all the conjugates, and the, um, not, not the highest coefficient, because this is always one, but the coefficient uh, of x to the k minus 1, which will be the, the opposite of the sum of all the roots. And, and this is called the trace. And these things are very important. Whenever you work with, uh, with, this, uh, with this finite field, you are going to see trace and norm uh, all over the place. OK. So the next thing is, is less, much less interesting, interesting but it, it's kind of important. And I, I want to show you an example, because it's really used in FFI, uh, in the finite uh, field isomorphism problem. So, Assume that you have a finite field defined by arithmetic modulo this polynomial f of x, and take two elements which are defined by polynomial with small coefficient. So, the, and this occurs all the time when you do FHG, so it should be familiar with, with, to you. And the, the question is, what is the size of the coefficient of the sum, and what is the size of the coefficient of the product? So, for the sum, it's quite clear. When you add things, if the things are small, the result is small. When you multiply, uh, in FHC, you, you usually want things to remain small when you multiply, because that's, that's the way you are going to prevent noise growth. So it's something very important. So, so what is going to happen for finite fields? So let's, let's take two examples. So I am taking, um, I am taking the first uh, irreducible polynomial that you see here. So it's a polynomial of degree 100 because I'm defining a, a field of size, a q to the 100 here. And you see that this polynomial contain only small coefficients. So it seems natural to assume that when you multiply, multiplication should behave nicely and it should be OK. So I, let me just pick a random element, a of x, and, but small, so only with 0, 1, and minus 1 in, the, in, in its decomposition. And let me just look at the square of this element. Because clearly, if multiplication grows slowly, squaring also grows slowly. So let's let's look at the square. And um, well, to me, this doesn't seem small. Especially if you remember, we are working modulo something which is a little bit over one thousand. So here you see element which goes to more than than six hundred in absolute value. So this is clearly noise. Okay. So second example, let's now take this polynomial f of x. Again, it has small coefficient. But on top of it, there is a gap between the coefficient of degree 100 and the coefficient of degree 50. There is a big gap where we just put only zeros. And we take the same element a of x. And now we look at what is the square now. And now the square looks somewhat better, kind of smallish. Okay, It goes up to. 
something like almost 200, but it's, it, seems, it seems better. They are not, not very big number anyway. So, so it seems that having such a gap can be, uh, can be important. So let's look at it uh, on a bigger example to check what's happening. So let's just take a bigger Q and see what's happening. So with the first polynomial, everything blows up. So it's clearly, it's clearly large just from a simple squaring. So, so the first polynomial is not going to work if you want to control noise. Uh, with the second one, okay, now it's, it's, really, it's really small because you see that the coefficients are not really bigger than what they were for Q equal 1000. So it seems that this is a reasonable choice. And indeed, if you look at the FFI paper for, for, for FHC, they explain somewhere in the paper, not, not in their definition of the, of the fields, but a little bit uh, later on, that they need this gap in order for what they call the expansion factor, so the, the growth of the coefficient when you do multiplication, to be small. And this is extremely important if you want things to work out. OK. So, so we have this generic good construction, which is you choose f of x to be x to the n plus a, a polynomial e of x of degree at most n over 2 and small coefficient. And in that case, everything will be, uh, will be nice. Uh, and why is that? It's because when you do a product, you are adding the degrees. And if you think about adding the degrees, you go from degree n minus one to two n minus two uh, on small coefficient, and then you, you do modular reduction. And the thing is that if you take a, a dense poly a, a polynomial that goes up to, up to degree n, you have to do modular reduction many times. So you have to do re modular reduction on the topmost coefficient, and you will you will impact lots of coefficient of the polynomials and you will have to do it again and again and again. And every time you do a reduction, you are increasing the coefficient. And if you do that many reduction, you are going to blow the coefficient up. But when there is a gap, what is happening is that when you, when you reduce the first coefficient in the polynomial, there is a large window that is completely unaffected by this reduction. So the only, the only increase concern much smaller, um, the coefficient of much smaller monomials. And because of that, you will only have a few steps in the reduction, so a few increasing of the coefficient. And uh, all in all, the, the expansion factor will be small. And in fact, reduction mod F will only wrap up twice, basically, when you, when you consider this specific choice, f of x equal x to the n plus uh, e of x. OK, so this is why this was considered for trying to do, um, to do a fully homomorphic encryption. And let's look, at the, let's look at how this was done very roughly. I don't want to go too much into the details. But I'm just taking a polynomial f of x with small expansion factor. Um, and I'm choosing an auxiliary uh, prime, uh, let's say two here. And the thing is that now is because of this small expansion factor, if A and B are small, A plus B is going to be small and A time B is going to be small. Okay, which means that if things are small, um, you will not need to reduce the number mod Q. They will just be obtained, they will be reduced modulo F of X, but not mod Q because it, they will be small, so there will be no need to reduce them, to keep them in the range between minus, uh, minus characteristic over two and plus characteristic over two. And now when you have this, there is a very standard way to encrypt bits that is well known for, in lots of FHC system. You just uh, take an encryption of zero and add a message to it, basically. So what you do is uh, you are going to encrypt a bit as a, a, a p time a small polynomial plus a message, and the other bit as p times a small poly, a, another small polynomial plus the other message. And when you add the, the two, you get p times something. And because it's never reduced modulo the characteristic of the field, this remains a multiple of p. So if you do uh, if you do the computation in the field and then reduce the result mod p the a of x and b of x vanish, and you just keep m of a plus m of b. So the decryption, so, so the decryption if, you could, if you could 
do this decomposition and see the decryption, the decryption of the sum will be the sum of the decryption. And for the product, it's the same because if it remains small, you will see that when you do the multiplication of these two things, you will get p squared times ab plus pa times the message b plus pb times the message a plus the product of the message. And everything is a multiple of p except the product of the message. So if you do the, the operation in the finite field, uh, defined with, with this polynomial f with a small expansion factor, then products of thing will be, uh, will be well, the sum on product will be compatible with, uh, with, with the encryption. OK. So now the question, of course, is you, you want to do that, but hide the message. Because if I'm doing it stupidly like this, everybody sees the message. Everybody can do the, can do the thing. So how can you hide the message from everybody except the, key, the owner of the key? And this is where you use the finite field isomorphism problem. So what you do is you want to have the private operation, so especially decryption, to use the good representation of the field and the public operation to be done in a random looking uh, representation of the finite field. And it can, be, it can even be tr a truly random representation of the finite field. So, so everything seems uh, seems good because if I give you an encryption of something in the in the bad representation, it seems very unlikely that you are going to see what's happening in the good representation. Okay, the problem is how do I sample these uh, these polynomial a and b, uh, which have to be in the good representation? How do I do that in the bad representation? And it's a very standard idea just give tons of encryption of zero basically so what you so here it it translates into give a large number of polynomial with small coefficient but don't give them directly into the good representation just give their uh, transformation to the bad representation so now if you want to get a small polynomial you just pick in this basis of small polynomial you add them together and you get something okay so now what is going to be the security of that scheme? And you have basically two, you, you have two basic problems. So you just assume that there is some hidden representation somewhere and that you know stuff in a bad representation G of Y, which is just a random uh, irreducible polynomial of the right degree. Um, there is a secret isomorphism that goes to the good representation, but of course you shouldn't know it. But what you are given as part of the public key, if you want to be able to do stuff, is a, a bunch of small polynomial, let's say a1 of x, a2 of x, up to a n of x, except that you only see them in the bad representation. So you see their image by the morphism one. And now you have two problems. As often in crypto, you have a computational problem, find a good representation, and you have a decisional problem is, OK, can you distinguish between polynomial constructed like this, which are small but in the bad representation, and completely random polynomial? And the thing is that the, the fully homomorphic scheme that I just sketched is proven secure under this, deci this decisional assumption. So it's very important to know, is this decisional assumption secure or not? Is it difficult or not? Okay, so um, so let's see. So uh, what what do I need to do? So given the image of the polynomial in the bad representation, I want to decide whether a of x is small or not. And there is not much I can do, but a very natural idea is to say, okay, I have an element now. I want to learn whether it's small in some representation. And the natural idea is to say, well, maybe this is linked to its natural properties. And you could try to look at the norm, doesn't give much. Uh, or at least I was not figure, able to figure out anything with the norm. But the trace, when you just compute traces, it seems that when you pick a small polynomial, the trace seems to be small. And well, is that true? And why is that, uh, is that true if, if it is? And to, to understand that, because of the linearity of the trace, 
So the trace of the sum is just the sum of the trace. Uh, we, you just need to look at the traces of alpha to the i, where alpha is this element in the good representation. And let's try to look at this trace. Good. So remember, we have taken a polynomial f of x for the good representation, that is x to the n plus e of x, where e has degree smaller than n over 2 and small coefficient, 0, 1, or minus 1. Okay. So um, what I, what I am going to do is um, I, I am going to, to define, so I'm going to do something very, a very standard trick. So take all the roots of this polynomial f of x and compute what are called the symmetric polynomials. So the symmetric polynomials, uh, the first one is just the sum of the root of the element. The second one is the sum of the pairwise product. The third one is the sum of triple products and so on and so forth. Okay. And it turns out that the symmetric polynomial are exactly the things that appear as coefficient in, uh, in f of x. If f of x has, uh, has uh, roots alpha 1, alpha n, then the symmetric polynomial in alpha 1, alpha n are exactly the things that appear in f of x. So here you have the sum, sigma 1. Here you have sigma n at the, at the end, which is a product. And in the middle, you have all these sums of, of partial products. Okay, and now remember, uh, all these symmetric polynomials, because f of x can be written as x to the n plus e of x of lower degree, the first symmetric polynomial have to be zero. Just otherwise, it wouldn't respect this constraint. So sigma 1 is going to be 0, sigma 2 is going to be 0, sigma 3 is going to be 0, and so on. OK, cool. And, and now it turns out that there is a link between this symmetric polynomial and the trace of the powers. So for, for the first element, it's very uh, there is nothing to be said. The trace of 1 is just 1 plus all its conjugate, so it's n. Nothing to be said. The trace of alpha is sigma 1, just by definition. So it's going to be 0. But the trace of alpha, alpha square now is a bit more complicated because it's the sum of the square. And how do you relate the sum of the square to the symmetric polynomial? And it turns out that the trace of alpha, so the sum of the square, the trace of alpha square, is sigma 1 squared, so the sum squared, minus 2 times the second symmetric polynomial. So it's also zero because sigma one and sigma two are, are zero. So it explains at least the very first things why uh, why these traces uh, uh, are small. But what about higher powers? And here I need to use uh, I need to use some uh, some explicit formula which are known in mathematics, and uh, which is how do you express powers? sums of powers in terms of the symmetric polynomial. And there is this magic formula called the Girard-Newton formula that really gives you any sum of powers as, uh, as a polynomial with integer coefficient in the, um, in the symmetric polynomials. And OK, this coefficient you see here might seem to be a fraction, but believe me, it's an integer. It's going to simplify when you look at the fraction. OK, good. So, so let's look at this formula. It's pretty complicated. And there is a big sum. You know, you sum on R1, R2, Rd, such that R1 plus 2R2 plus 3R3 plus DRD is equal to D. How, how are we going to compute that? It seems to be very complicated. But let's have a look. Uh, and try to apply this to the trace of alpha D, which is just a sum of the this power of all the conjugate of alpha. And so one thing which is clear is that the only things that contribute to this sum are the products which are non-zero. Any zero is not going to contribute to the sum. So, and, and the thing is that if, if in the product there is any term with index smaller than n over two, because of the sparsity of f, this coefficient is going to be a zero. So now we, we are just looking, we just need to restrict this sum to sums where the exponent for the small sigmas are zero. 
the exponent for sigma one should be zero. Otherwise, the product would be would would vanish. The exponent for sigma two should be zero. So this means we we need to find a solution to the, to sum of well, the, the, the equation I have here in the middle. So the sum from n over two to d of i r i should be equal to d. Okay, good. But let's think. Um, how is it possible to add more than one number bigger than n over two? Uh, so this. Um, and get d. Okay, and we have to look at the relation between d and n over two. So clearly, when d is smaller than n over two, it's just not possible. If we take a, if you take sums of numbers which are bigger than uh, than than n over two, you will never get d if d is smaller. So so all the all the the traces of alpha of alpha to the d when d is small are just going to be zero. And when d is bigger than n over two, but at most n, for a very similar reason, you can see that the only way you can get sum to d is by having everything to be zero, except having one d in the sum. But if you have one d in the sum, it means that everything is going to vanish in this thing, except one single term. And because there is a d here at the beginning of the, of, of the expression, uh, the non-zero contribution for, for trace of alpha to the D is going to be either minus D or plus D. And it could also be zero in some cases. Okay, so whatever that means is that uh, all the traces are going to be small for any power of alpha. So now if you take an element, which is a sum of powers of alpha with small coefficient, you are adding small traces so the, at the end of the day, the, the global trace also has to be small. OK, so now it means that the security proof is lost. The D FFI problem is easy. So the FHE encryption, which rely on this uh, DFFI problem, uh, is no longer proven secure. But OK, you might tell me, yes, but it often happens that you lose the security proof of a, of a crypto system but you still cannot break the system practically. So let's see, is the scheme secure and can we do something? Well, let's look at, at an encryption EA, which is going to be P time a small polynomial plus a message. And let's try to find uh, the message. And since we have been using the trace, let's just compute the trace. And what you see here is that, okay, the trace is P time trace of A, which is clearly going to be a small multiple of p plus n times the message. Okay, so if n, if p doesn't divide n, you will just see by computing this stress whether the message is zero or not, if p does not divide n. But if p divides m, n, well, everything is going to be zero independently of whether the bit you encrypted is a zero or a one. And it turns out that in many of the parameters that were proposed, n is indeed a multiple of p. Okay, so just because it was p equal two in their choice and n was uh, uh, an, an, an even power, uh, an even extension. Okay, so it doesn't seem to work. Well, in fact, what you, you can still make it work thanks to the fully homomorphic property. So we use it to break stuff. So what we are going to do is we are going to look for a small element uh, whose trace is going to be one mod p. Uh, you might tell me, yes, but we don't know the representation. So there is no way we can build such a small element. Well, we have been given a database of small elements. So just compute their traces. And because we have so many, it's very likely that one of them will have trace one. And if it's stress, uh, if it's stress three, assuming that three is a co prime to p, it should also be good. So, so let's assume we find one with stress one. And now what we are going to do is we are going to do trace of b time e of a. And because everything remains small, it will be a multiple of p plus m of a plus the message bit times the trace of b. 
and this time we clearly decrypt again. Okay, so 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 it means that th this uh, this fully homomorphic encryption is not secure, and it's very interesting because that, uh, when they proposed it, they looked at it from the angle of uh, of lattice reduction, and they said, can we recover by using lattice reduction the good um, the good representation, so f of x, and they concluded that well the, this lattice reduction is going to be difficult. And indeed, it's not that easy. If you want to recover f of x to solve the computational problem, it's not that easy. It's easier than they thought, but it's not that easy. Uh, but 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 on the other end, the encryption scheme is completely broken just because we we can break the decision problem by using elementary properties of finite fit. Okay, and. So uh, yeah, so this is uh, basically the end of my talk. So I was told I had an hour, but I just did in 40 minutes. So if you have, uh, if you have questions, I am of course uh, uh, very happy to take them. So Mark, I hope you, you didn't expect me to. Uh, oh, that's, that's perfect. Then. Thank you, Anton. Are there questions for uh, Antoine? So you can directly ask, ask your question or uh, write in the chat as you want. Oh, I need to open the chat somewhere then. Um... Questions for Antoine? Yeah, Pascal is yes. asking a question. Yes, hi. <laughs> Salut, Antoine. Pascal. Uh, th thank you for your super interesting talk. Um, so what would you say the, um, how do you, how do you feel? I mean, there is some kind of a hope that using FFI, we could do a morphic encryption. How would you, uh, are you confident that this could work or I mean, if there's a way to break it, is there a way to repair it? And how, how do you feel towards this whole concept and attempt? Uh, I is, is, it, is it doomed to fail completely? Whatever happens, it will fail? Or do you think there is maybe some space for, you know, for it to work? Uh... I I don't know. I, I didn't didn't try at all to repair it. So it seemed very it seemed very broken like this. So uh in, in this way. So how, how could you try to hmm. I, I didn't see any any way to try to go and repair it. So so that's um So yes, someone is also asking in the chat about the, the implementation. We, would it be faster? Uh, I, I really didn't try to implement it, but but finite field operation are something we 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 know quite well. So it should it should be reasonably fast. I mean, uh, it should be possible to optimize stuff a lot. But uh, but if it's not secure, it's kind of irrelevant if it, whether it's fast or not. So. But yeah, Pascal, I don't know if you have any idea of, on how to repair it on your side, but... Uh, uh, actually, I'm, I'm not super confident that it will ever work anyways. Uh, so, but I mean, the intention and the motivation is sound. I mean, it, it, there could be somewhere in there, or at least it seems to me like legitimate to try this approach. Uh, but apart from that, I... Yeah, intuitively, I'm, I'm not confident at all, at all that, that it could be made secure. Like, I don't see how this could work. What you work, could but... try is you, you could try to make it more complicated, and, uh, but, but the problem is that um, you, you, you could try to introduce other, stuff, other ingredients, but the problem is that when you start introducing other ingredients, it looks like something else completely, I mean. You you yeah. you could of course you could of course put ent entry in inside of this uh, of these kind of things and try to to do something based on but yeah it's uh, 
at so at some point it's going to be uh, so far from the initial proposal that you it will be no uh, yeah it will really yeah. be unclear whether it's uh, the same thing at all yeah i think there are other questions in the chat uh yes yeah, there are there are other question um you can you can unmute yourself and ask a question directly if you want so so what, one of the question was how secure is it well i think we address it currently it's not secure that's uh, that's the thing um so victor uh well the the, the so Victor is asking whether there is a link between this and uh, and all the on uh, on the uh, the polynomial factoring algorithm of Lenstra to ca to um, to calculate isomorphisms and uh, uh, well there is a link in the in in the fact that you, if you wanted to implement the scheme you had to find a good. Uh, uh, good implementation of computing this isomorphism and all these things. Um, but for the breaking part, I am not sure. Um, so th th there is a link. If you want to use FFI, you need a. Um, so, so by the way, typically, if you want to use FFI, so I'm okay, we, we don't because it doesn't seem secure, but um, one, there are several ways to, to sample the, the keys. So first, you have to choose uh, the polynomial, the good representation with the small expansion factor. And then you have to find the bad one. And it turns out that um, the easiest way to find the bad one is not to pick a polynomial, an irreducible polynomial at random and factor it in the other basis. Just go the other direction. Pick a random, a completely random element in the, in the finite field given by the good representation. And now look for the minimal polynomial of this completely random element. And this is faster than, uh, than trying to go the, in the reverse direction. And it's equivalent, because if you pick a completely random element, check that it doesn't belong to a subfield, it's the same thing as picking a random irreducible polynomial. Um, and OK. If you increase the expansion factor to make the f little less sparse, I don't think there is a lot of room there. If you um, because you can you, you if you increase uh, increasing the expansion factor is going to mean uh, that you um, that you zero fewer of the of the irreducible of the sorry of the symmetric polynomial, but you still have to zero quite a lot of them. And so it means that basically traces are probably going to remain small. Even if there are a little bit more options, I don't see how you could how you could find a balance between uh, a reasonable expansion factor and on because e, e, yeah, if the expansion if, if the traces are not small, then then there will be crazy things happening when you do the multiplication. So it's I, I don't think it 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 would it would work to to try to make f a little less sparse. And possible applications, uh, I, I I I I don't see exactly what you are asking here. So that's uh, the last question in the chat by uh, Sougo Pierre. Uh, what are the possible application? Well, so yeah. So now uh, the new question is, is there a way to save this proposal by relying on the computational FFI problem instead? But the problem is that if you want to save it, you have to really change how things are encrypted because because we have a semantic attack. We can we can we, we can decrypt we, without solving uh, the computational FFI. We just do these traces computation and and get whether the message was a zero or a one, the message B. So if you want to. Um, if you want to rely on uh, on the on on a weaker assumption which still seems hard to, uh, to solve, um, then you have to change the way the encryption is done. 
and changing the way the encryption is done while keeping the fully homomorphic property, that seems to be pretty hard. And at least I don't see how to do it. But yeah, if you don't change it, it's, it's, it's completely broken. It's not only the, the underlying assumption, it's also the scheme. More questions for, for Antoine? Maybe I have one, but I'm not sure it's correct. Um, so the, the reason the, the, the trace needs to, to be small is for the multiplication. So does it mean that you could use such an ID, so the uh, FFI as a way to just have uh, additive uh, homomorphic encryption? Uh, well, yeah, if, if you just want additive uh, isomorphism, then... Uh, then you don't need uh, you don't need this this sparsity constraint and um, and and then at least yeah the attack would would not work but uh, but but there are so many other ways to do uh, just uh, just additive encryp uh, homomorphic encryption that I don't know if it would be worth it. I. I I, I, yeah. Do you, do you think it would be uh... Uh, yeah, it's a new problem, so I don't know. So yeah, I okay. I yeah. If you if you just if you just if you take f of f to be full, then uh, then clearly everything is going to explode. So. So the trace, uh, the trace technique, and and especially the second part of the semantic attack, where we have to multiply by something to extract the the value when when n is a multiple of p. Uh, this there is no way this can work if the if the expansion factor is large, because then everything is going to wrap around, and you will have no way to know whether the message was a zero or one. But. Um... But I, yeah, I don't know if anyone would uh, would be uh, yeah. would be interested in in using this just just to get this just to get uh, additive uh, uh, homomorphic encryption. Okay. M maybe Pascal he, he can can answer this better than I. Um, no, I think. Yeah, it it seems a little bit far fetched just for additively, you know, additive, I mean, partially homomorphic encryption. Yeah, but you never know. You never know. It could it could be made efficient. The question, the big question is, would would still, I mean, is it still secure to do that if you kind of eliminate the multiplication of the picture? And that doesn't seem completely trivial to answer that. Well, I, at at least the attack we have would uh, wouldn't work. So so you would have yeah. to you would have to study in much more details to try to yes. see whether it's uh, secure or not. Yeah. So yeah, if someone wants to if someone wants to do that, then it's it answers the last question in the chat. <laughs> someone was asking, is there any future research focus for this? Yeah, maybe maybe try to yeah to to relax uh, this expansion factor things and uh, and find a new a new uh, weaker but 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 maybe more secure application. Okay. More questions. No, last chance. Okay, so if not, so thank you, thank you very much, uh, Antoine, and so and enjoy the uh, evening, everyone, or morning. I don't know. So where you are? So thanks again for the the invite. Thank bye you, bye. Everyone. Thank you, bye, everyone.